river run, run through the hills, run river run to the sea, run river run to your place beneath the sun, run river run over me, run through the land. You Hi, this is Jan Lewis. Welcome to be my guest. This is uh, the day that we are going to have Tim Beard with us. He is the author of The Dragon in the Whites. He's from Holden. Welcome, Tim. Hey, nice to meet you, Jan. Thank you for and, having me. And uh, you set me straight. Holden is not far from, <laughs> pardon my ignorance, but near West Boylston, right? Yeah, it's just a little west of West Boylston and Worcester. Now, how long did take you to get here? Um, from Clinton, where I live, about 35, 36 minutes or I've so. I've been up to that yeah. library in Clinton. Yeah, That's Clinton has a nice, the big, low, free public library. Yeah, very nice they're, library. They're, out, they're uh, pretty active with different events, aren't they? Yeah, they do a lot of community events for the kids and adults alike, and I'm actually currently scheduled to participate in an event in October where they're going to have some local authors. So I look forward to that. Good. I love to hear that. The Dragon in the White. So I don't know if you can zero in on this, Paul, but you did you pick the cover? Uh, so I created it using the cover creator program that yeah. Amazon has for their authors. Yeah. They actually give you a lot of different tools to come up with it, and using some different artwork and my own personal preferences, I kind of came up with something that I thought was simple and tasteful, yet sort of got the mm -hmm. message across a little it, bit. It looks like deep claws yep. going in. To so I want it to basically look like a, that, I was right a slash there. going down the front of the, the page. That's an excellent picture of you. Uh, even with the hat, I know who you are. <laughs> now... Okay. How long ago did you start writing it? Uh, realistically, I started about four years ago, mm -hmm. but it was a hobby that I did off and on on the side. You know, put in maybe a, an hour or two here and there. Didn't really focus too much on it. It was just a yeah. little diversion to disappear for a couple hours mentally. Uh, but about uh, maybe a year or so ago, I really started to dive into it. You did? And ended up getting uh, some real solid work in there. And I typed for probably like eight months straight or so. And yeah. Uh, well, on the side, you know, while still working full time, and really. What do you uh, do full time? I'm a mechanical engineer at a large plastics company in Clinton. Well, you've you've got a lot on your plate. You're writing a book. You're I stay busy. Yes. You're, and he, you have an 18 month old. Uh, 17 months old. Yeah, Liam was just born. Boy? Uh, uh, yep, little uh -huh. Liam. Oh well, congratulations to mummy and Liam and <laughs> we got daddy right here. You're first. Yep. We've been having a great time so far. Yeah. He's How's a great kid. He's doing real good? Yeah. Is he he's sleeping for you now? Oh, we were actually very spoiled with that. He started sleeping probably seven hours, maybe like a what? two months into it. Yeah. The kid loves to sleep. So Ours, it's great my, for us. Gee, my son kept waking. We couldn't figure it out. And then, see, if mother, one of the mothers told me, put a little bit of the um, oatmeal cereal that they drink, they eat, mm -hmm. baby oatmeal, into his bottle. He's probably hungry. Yeah. And... I could relate because I can't go to bed on an empty stomach. So the doctor was saying, oh, no, 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 not till he's six months old. And the mothers were saying, look, do it. It's fine. He's going to be okay. He was hungry. Yeah. He would have some and go right to sleep. Yep. It didn't take him long. My son never cries except in the morning when he wants his bottle of milk. He's hungry. Yep. And as long as you get him his milk, he's a happy kid. What did he weigh when he was born? Uh, don't quote me on it. He was just a hair over eight. And he, he was, was a big boy. Yeah. And he was about 22 inches long, so... Oh, okay. He could be kid. very tall like you, right? Yeah, my my wife did most of the work. Yes, I'll say that. Of <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the way it goes, isn't it? <laughs> uh -oh. I don't know. The days of the guys fainting, I think, are over. Though maybe not. I don't know. But most of the guys step right up there and help out. I was excited by the whole process. I, I was yeah. looking forward to meeting him. Yeah, so. what hospital did you go to? Uh, we did uh, St. V's in Worcester. Okay, we went to Memorial. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, anyway, Dragon in the Whites. Without giving away the ending, tell us about what it's about. Uh, so it is about a young boy in Iceland about a millennia ago, and he discovers this stone when he's hiking on a mountain uh, that's on a small volcanic island just off the southwest coast of Iceland. Mm -hmm. uh, they refer to it as the Westman Islands. And it, uh, you know, he ends up finding this, doesn't really know what it is, keeps it, and as his life progresses, eventually that stone turns into something else. Mm -hmm. And suddenly in New England, in modern time, there's a dragon terrorizing the countryside. And the protagonist of the story sort of falls into a situation where he feels responsible for the dragon being present and spends a large chunk of his young adult life basically searching out this dragon, yeah. trying to find it, trying to resolve this issue that he brought upon the world. and. Uh, the book is basically sort of the conclusion of that adventure towards the end of it. Where did you come up with this? Uh, a lot of it was 
places I've been. So mm -hmm. the island that it starts in, I physically was there during uh, my junior year of college. Mm -hmm. I took a trip to Iceland, did uh, my yes. junior project there. What were you what, what were you studying? We did a project on the cogeneration plant that's there, where mm -hmm. they basically take the steam and hot water from the ground, mm -hmm. they run it through the turbines, generate electricity, and then disperse the water out to the towns to basically, you know, shower, heat their homes, mm -hmm. heat the roads with, uh, you know, different radiant heating and yeah. and the the project encompassed it from an economic standpoint so it was a very sort of sciencey math based project but yeah. we were in Iceland so we had plenty of time to go and explore and we went hiking and camping and riding our bikes wow. everywhere and had a great time and junior year in college yep wow so one of the places we went was sort of the inspiration yeah. for the beginning of the story and I just loved it there you know we, we camped out we spent two nights there uh, we went hiking we saw puffin and seals and all sorts of other we great animals se seals. <laughs> they're so cute watching them out in the wild and oh, yeah. it, it was just a beautiful setting and it sort of inspired me to have that be the setting of the work as I began and then what I really want to do was capture a story like this that I could bring my son to someday mm -hmm. because I love fantasy books I love sci-fi but they always take place in these realms that are out in space or some mm -hmm. faraway land or some mythical you know English countryside mm -hmm. 2,000 years ago that you know you're not really ever going to be there right. but what I wanted was a story that was today yeah. that you could you know spend the, the three hours to drive up to the White Mountains and oh, go yeah. see the locales that are in that story Wait, how did you pronounce his name? Trivgi B. Bjornsson? Uh, Trivgi Bringerson. So I had an Icelandic uh, sponsor and, um, I guess, uh, advisor for one of my projects. Mm -hmm. And I loved his name, and I fell in love with the different Icelandic names that they have while we were over there. So I sort of got a little creative going through uh, the list of Icelandic children's names when I came up you with some did. of my characters. I've never heard of so. Trivgi. 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 Yep. And he was exploring the tiny island of, I when I was reading, I couldn't, West what? Uh, Vestmanyar. Vestmanyar. So in, in Icelandic, now granted a person in Iceland would probably say I'm botching the name, but that's yeah. about as accurate as I've heard it and been able to relay it. Uh, but the sort of uh, English version of it is the Westman Islands. Oh. So now, all right, so when you were a kid, were you already starting to write a little bit on the side? I loved reading. I just poured over every book that I could get, and I loved writing in English classes and literature classes. But I never really grasped the love of it because yeah. I have a hard time when somebody says, you must read this book oh, okay. and write a report on it. Yeah. You instantly sort of push back a little bit. I remember that back in uh, was high school. We had to read the, what are they, the famous, rel I call them relics, but some of them were like, it was just a chore to get through it. And I knew I had to. So I loved reading those, but I if you told me go voluntarily read it, mm -hmm. here's a pile of books, read them when you get to it. Yeah. I would just dive into it and read it. Sure. But it's tough when somebody says, you know, read this in two weeks and, and write a book a report on it. Yeah. And there'll be a test. So, you know, it was hard for me to go through those classes, even though I did very well. Mm -hmm. uh, I always gravitated towards math and science, but did much, much better in my English based courses. So when I got older and started having more free time academically after I graduated, mm -hmm. I started writing off to the side, but a lot of times the different things I would write, I'd get 10 pages into a Word doc and just yeah. I'd lose interest and I would okay. hit save, put did it away you, in the folder. Did that happen to you with this or did you just go right through it? There was at least a two year period where I didn't touch the document because I was doing it in Google Docs and I was able to see like the last save points yeah. and I'd written maybe like 30 pages of it yeah. and then didn't touch it for about a two year period. So when I say it took me four years to write it, it was really probably a solid 12 months if I added everything up. Yeah. Uh, but it was over a very long period of time because, you know, I was uh, I have two master's degrees, so after I graduated, I ended up going to school part-time for eight years. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, got married, bought a condo, bought a house, went through the whole rigmarole of being an adult. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was one of those things where writing was just, it was always kind of there, but sure. I might not write for a month. Yeah. Then I'd write solid for two days. Anybody so. else in your family talented this way? Um, my sister is very musical. My wife is a great teacher. So I have mm. the other arts in the family. Your son uh, really is going to have that. I think we're interested to see what he gravitates towards and what yeah. he wants to do. So. And you help you volunteer with do youth robotics program. Yep. So when I was in high school in Clinton, there's uh, the first robotics program, mm -hmm. and I volunteer with that and uh, the Lego version of it, the first Lego League. Mm -hmm. uh, most of the towns around here have at least a team somewhere they participate. Okay. Worcester is very big into it. I'm seeing this in the newspaper. Yep, and you saw it probably just on the news last night because there was a big story floating yes. around where there were some girls from Afghanistan coming. Yes. So the competition I volunteer for was the competition they were trying to get into. Did they? Who won on that? 
Um, I admittedly can't remember because <laughs> I I wasn't I didn't go there, so yeah. I haven't been following it as accurately as I should. But yeah. uh, no, yeah. I plan on this weekend watching some videos on YouTube. You know, quite th you you work your days designing industrial robotics and automated systems. You vo you volunteer for the kids for the youth robotics. Mm -hmm. You're an author. Is there another one coming? <laughs> uh, so what I did is I see this realistically as sort of a like a five book series. Mm -hmm. So I you know the the natural fantasy novel that you often see is one of those books that's like this thick mm. and they crank out these thousand page books. I wanted to make something that was a little easier to digest so when I had this story I have it all laid out in some bullet points and I have it all spread out with different really character plots. Yeah. I, I'm an engineer by trade yeah. so obviously whatever I do I design mm -hmm. so I have to have a good design to start so whether I'm making a robot or a piece of automation for work mm -hmm. or I'm writing a book I'm gonna organize it I'm gonna lay it out I'm gonna make sure that whatever happens at the beginning flows with what happens at the end. So you're not gonna do an impulsive like I got this idea to put into the book? Um, I'm sure I might do that at some point as yeah. a little side story because there's a couple little things in there that even after I wrote it and published it, I looked back and I was like, well, maybe the story probably could have excluded okay. that and the yeah. story could have still been there. Yeah. So maybe those in the future end up being short stories or something like that if I organize a little bit better. But yeah. I feel like it's it's an art. You can have fun with it, do oh, whatever yeah. you want. It's a great springboard, this one. The Dragon in the Whites. And where can they get a copy besides downstairs in our lobby? Where can you get it? So it is available as either an electronic copy or a paper copy on Amazon. So if you go to Amazon.com mm -hmm. and just search for my name or the Dragon and the Whites, uh, and if you're looking for additional information about it, you can also go to my website, TimBaird.us, and I'm also on Facebook as Tim Baird Author. Tim Baird, B-A-I-R-D. No, yep. I just misspoke. It's not in our lobby. <laughs> it's on the up downstairs. We have the author's wall in the Upton Library, mm -hmm. and um, you can go in. If it's not up there yet, ask Matt for the copy and. Uh, you can tell a lot of them that are taken out more than others because we had one paranormal investigator, gosh, I had her on a couple of times, her book was like, you could tell it was all like this, you could tell it millions, yeah. it's a great, another great way to get it out because if they decide they like it long enough, they're going to go buy it, definitely, they're going to yeah. go, where have you appeared? A couple of places, right? Uh, so I was recently in Worcester Magazine and the Clinton Item, and I recently interviewed with the Holden Landmark, and the Telegram and Gazette is currently reading the book and may include it in a piece sometime soon. That's excellent. That Thank really you. is. I was just going to say, would you consider it a fantasy or a kind of a sci-fi fantasy genre? What would you say? It's definitely more fantasy right now, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll tell you the, the book that I'm currently in, like I said, it's a uh, geared towards probably a five-book series. Mm -hmm. I'm currently in number two. But what I did is when I got to the last page of this book, I literally just kept going. Mm. I sort of just drew a line in the sand and then just kept writing. So I'm about a third of the way through uh, book number two. So I didn't want to lose my momentum, so I just oh. kept going. Uh, so Has it got the same title, but, but uh, number book two? The working title right now is Washington's Dragon Hunter. Oh, okay. So it sort of takes off where the protagonist and his friend leave off in this book, mm -hmm. and it's the continuation of their adventure as time goes on. When do you think that'll be coming out? Well, if I kept up with the pace that I've been going at, I could maybe finish it within a year. Hey, wow. So, that would be great. Well, I mean, that's the thing. You know, doing it part-time, still trying to obviously get out and enjoy the, the sunshine and the yeah. nice weather. And, and a new baby. And a new baby, spend time with my family. Is so. he cruising or is he walking now? Uh, he is a solid walker with some good running. Oh, so nice. we've been getting some exercise lately, yeah, yeah. chasing around the house. Yeah, our son faked <laughs> us out. We didn't want to push him. You know, we've all heard that don't push your kid to walk because that's not good. They need to take their time. Well, we were really too lax probably about it. And uh, we were in a doctor's waiting room, and this woman had, an older lady had a fancy jewelry thing on. He saw it, and he wanted it. Mm -hmm. He climbed up, he got up, held on to the, the coffee table, and went right over to her. And I'm like, you little turkey, you've been faking us out the whole time. He just needs proper motivation. Yeah. Yeah, he needs yeah. something shiny to go look after. He wanted it. Yep. Yeah. He, oh, gee. <laughs> <laughs> now, the dragon in the whites, is the, is the next one going to have the same color of the, of the, uh, of the cover? Um, it's that? still definitely a work in progress, so yeah. I don't know. We'll see. Do you self-publish? Uh, yeah, <coughs> so I did this all through Amazon. They have a beautiful program called Kindle Direct Publishing where they lay out the whole toolbox for you of different tools that you need yep. to basically take it from a Word doc or a Google doc and bring it up to the published thing that you see in front of you. So what I did is I went in and totally for free for me, I created the cover art, I did the um, 
the photo with one of my friends, Samantha Melanson. You can check out her website at samanthamelanson.com. Mm -hmm. She provided the uh, sort of the rights to use the picture and uh, uploaded my uh, the manuscript of the document. You know, formatted it for the different paper size I wanted to use, and mm -hmm. next thing I know, I have a book. And you have it. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if each each part of the series is going to be the same thickness, do you think? The same amount of pages? Um, if I stick with how I'm thinking about it, I have basically five chunks, I think, is how it's going to come out. So I have to anticipate that book number two is going to be the same or maybe a little thicker. You know, that's good because I, I know I go into libraries sometimes and, and some of the series, especially the fantasy for the kids, you know, so if I was that age, I probably wouldn't bother. I don't know why, but they're like this thick. Yeah, well, they put them on the thicker paper that I think is less uh, likely to be ripped, and then they put bigger font. But, you know, you look yeah. at, the like, the first Harry Potter book that came out, it's about that thick. And yeah. then yeah. You, know, you look at the last one, Deathly Hollows, is like, that thick. Did you like so Harry Potter? I loved Harry Potter. I couldn't yeah. get into it. Maybe it's because I'm not into, uh, first of all, I'm not into sci-fi. This was, like, a borderline, so that's okay. That was cool. Yeah. I like that. Um, I'm thinking that the age group on this could be, what do you think, reading it? I'm thinking probably, like, teen or young adult. Uh, there's definitely nothing bad in the book, but it's not its not a kid's book, let's, say, let's just yeah. say that. Somebody who's a reader maybe in uh, junior high, high school? Yeah, I could see probably 7th, 8th grade or higher. I love the way the, uh, that you did the, the printing. I know that there's something called Create Space. Yeah. And a lot so of the authors I talk to are self-published, and I always recommend, try look at least look at Create Space, mm -hmm. because that's a really cool thing. You can design your cover, no one's going to tell you, like publishers do, they just take it and they do it on their own. You can create it on your own, mm -hmm. and then order as many as you want. Um, it's supposed to be pretty economical, isn't it? Yeah, so the KDP, I believe, is supposed to be the evolution of CreateSpace, mm -hmm. and this is where we were talking before, where uh, CreateSpace, I think, offers more functionality if you're trying to get into bookstores, mm -hmm. whereas KDP is supposed to be more streamlined if you're looking to stay electronic only. Mm -hmm. So the way I see it is... I love having paper books in my hand, mm. but you know, okay. if you look at the market, it seems like e-readers is probably where things are going to go eventually. I hope not. So I try <laughs> to perhaps embrace where I think the future of reading is going. Yeah. So I wanted to make sure that regardless, the book would be a good presentation in an e-format. So if one of my friends has Kindle or an iPad or something, they want to read it on the screen, mm -hmm. I want it to look good. Yeah. So I actually designed it first to be an e-reader book. Mm -hmm. And then I made a separate copy that was supposed to be for print only. So I actually formatted them separately to make sure it looked good in both formats. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, first and foremost, you know, people are downloading their books. Mm. You know, I myself have just recently adopted doing audiobooks because You're I, have doing a, audio now. I have a half an hour commute each way. Yeah. So for an hour a day, instead mm. of just listening to the radio, That's I great. now get an hour a day more of, of a book that what I. What is it like to. I'm, I'm so used to. When I read a book, I'm almost. It's almost like a. a I'm picturing everything in my mind, and I can. I love doing that. I can't imagine driving along and just having somebody read to me. Last time I was read to was when I was eight years old. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I will admit, uh, when you get into high traffic areas, yeah. I'll hit pause because what happens is either you focus on the reading and yeah. you're not paying attention to the road as well as you should be, yeah. or you focus on the intersection, I'm shifting gears, I'm going through, and suddenly I realize that it's been two minutes since I listened. You miss part. And you just miss the whole big chunk. So then what you got to do is you either got to rewind it or you basically just pretend like you know what's going on and pick it up. Yeah, so a lot of times if I know I'm coming to a big intersection, so I drive a manual car and I'm trying to pay attention, so a lot of times I'll just hit pause. Yeah. And then once I get through the intersection, I'll resume it and keep I listening. See, so I still see, thank goodness, <clears throat> in the waiting rooms, um, places I go, people are still reading regular paper, mm -hmm. you know, books. Once in a while, you know, I'll see somebody, will, I asked for somebody one time, can I take a look at that? And I looked at the, probably, I guess it was Kindle, whatever it was. I'm like, okay, I got it. You finish the page, you tap it, tap it. But you just order them for that. You don't get to keep a library yep. full of them. What do you think of that? So what I do is I'm a big Star Wars fan. So uh -huh. I buy, so every Star Wars book I read, uh -huh. I have in paperback. And uh -huh. I have them all in chronological order as the story goes. But if it's basically a non uh Star Wars or non, one of the authors I maybe follow, mm -hmm. a lot of times I'll get the e-reader book mm -hmm. simply because I could spend a little bit less money, it takes up less room in the house, and if I don't think I'm going to read it again, I'll get it as an e-reader because you yeah. only spend, you know, maybe two ninety nine. but if I want to read it again, I like having the paper in my hand, exactly. I like having it there, so. Yeah, I usually, t I give away, I donate the books that, you know, I probably won't read again, mm -hmm. but I, I've got like two, I've called three mini libraries in my own home. Yep. Besides the pile beside the bed. 
<laughs> well, I meet so many authors. I got theirs. Plus, I haven't met a library I don't like. You know the feeling. You mm -hmm. go. Do you do you go to a lot of libraries? I'm more of a used bookstore fan. Oh. I love going in and just kneeling down on the floor mm -hmm. and going through all the books that are ninety nine cents a piece. And you know, I went you to one in Franklin. I can't think of the name of it. So it's, it's a big old factory building, and he has commandeered the whole first floor. Yeah. Stacks of old books. The Shire. The Shire. S H. Thank you, Paul. S H I R E. Oh, Shire. So check that out later. Shire. It's yeah. over in Franklin. Mm -hmm. um, it's not ninety nine cents a book, though. I mean, he. Well, I, I mean, if it's a good book, I'll still yeah. spend four ninety nine on a used paperback that yeah. might have been seven ninety nine or something new. But it so depends it's on condition and how good it is. Yeah, so. he had. I mean, stacked. I don't know how he did it. Way, way, way up. Yeah. Old, old building. Mm -hmm. I was really amazed. He was a pretty nice guy. Yeah. Yeah, he cool. was a really nice guy. Now, when you are at home alone or whatever, and you have time to read, do you pick up sci fi ma mainly on your own? Um, I'd say probably sci-fi mm -hmm. is what I gravitate towards more. I like spaceships and space battles. You like that the best? Yeah. What did your family think of your book? Um, my wife really likes it, yeah. and obviously I can't wait to read it to my son. Yeah. So, and, and that's the thing is the protagonist is named Liam, because what I wanted is I want to someday read this to my son and sure. have him say, hey, my name is Liam too. Sure. And I'm like, well, this is, you know, you're the protagonist. Daddy wrote and the first book when you were, say, 17 months old? Well, I started oh, it started. Uh, started it just after my wife and I were married, so he was still a, a future plan. He was just a glimmer in the eye. But I actually already called the character Liam because yeah. I love the name Liam, yeah. and I knew that someday when we were thinking about children, he would be at least on the, the short list of names, oh. and it, uh, it all worked out it that it, worked we out ended well. up picking Liam. So. Tim, again, how can people get a hold of you and your book? So people can go to my Facebook page and look up Tim Baird, B-A-I-R-D, on Facebook as the author. You can go to my website, timbaird.us, or you can search for me on Amazon.com. Now, if people want to have you appear somewhere, mm -hmm. would they still be able to reach you at those... Um Yes, uh, Facebook is probably the best because I check that most often yeah. on my phone and my desktop. So shoot me a message on Facebook and um, I'll look forward to connecting with you. Okay, now you have some coming up. Some, let's talk about that again. Where are you going to be coming up by appearing? So in a couple months I'll be at an event at the Clinton Bigelow Free Public Library. So that be September, right? Uh, I think it was like early October they okay. were given as a tentative date. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm always kind of posting on my website so you can follow those places there and try to see what I'm up to. Boy, I mean, you've got, you're going to have your hands full with your son, your regular job, your volunteering for robotics with youth, and this book. Have, have a lot of the kids that you deal with, are they old enough to read this yet? Um, I'd say most of the adults, the, ah. my fellow mentors, have been really gravitating towards it. It was yeah. really neat the very first time my friend Dana came up to me at a competition. And he's like, hey, will you sign my book? Yeah. And that was like the first time I was out in public yeah. that somebody wanted to sign my book that yeah. brought it to me that I didn't give to them. Yeah. So that was sort of like the real kind of first exciting buzz of, you know, mm -hmm. I'm an author. I know so. that you would enjoy, I think you would enjoy, this year it's, you don't, you're not ready for it yet, but the um, the annual in Danvers Port, that, ex, that uh, New England ex Expo, it's the largest grassroots authors expo in, I guess, New England. Yeah, I've been reading about it. It sounds very exciting. I just wasn't ready for it this year, no, but I look but forward to going next year. Next year, yeah. It's, yeah. Al it's always the last Wednesday of the month. Mm -hmm. And the public is allowed in from 4 to 8 or 9, so like that. but then you yeah. guys are come come early. You get to schmooze with each other. And yeah, it looked like there was a lot of good conferences oh, yeah. and meet and greets and speeches yeah. and different discussions. So. Did you ever see where it is? Did you ever look online and see the huge... I saw like what the town it was. I didn't check into it too deeply. So. Huge, beautiful. You could have a wedding in there reception. It's yeah. Beautiful big ballroom. Very cool. They fill it with the different authors. Um, and then, of course, downstairs after, you could always have dinner in this wonderful restaurant. Oh, nice. It's a great, great place to be. Thank you, Tim, for being with us. Well, thank, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. up to date on when the next one comes. Oh, definitely. All right? All righty? Yeah. We'll see you next time. I'll be my guest. Thank you. Shooting stars